In this part of the lecture, I'm going to compare the two methods of switching, sort of controlling the thickness of the tunneling barrier versus energy filtering or density of state switching. So as we saw earlier, there's really two ways to obtain a steep turn-on in tunneling. One is to change the thickness of the tunneling barrier from a thick barrier, where then we apply some voltage, pull this down and make the barrier thinner and switch it on. Or alternatively, we can rely on the alignment of the band edges, where here they don't align and so no current can flow. With a little bias, they do align and so all of a sudden we can get a sharp turn on. So now the problem is, in practice, there's a lot of issues with both of these mechanisms. And so now let's try to go through and understand what are all the challenges that we need to overcome. So first, let's try to make an estimate of what are the steepness we can get from barrier thickness modulation. And so what I want to do is consider just a simple PN junction here where we have some, some barrier and so we'll have a tunneling probability through it and some potential across it. And so what we want to know is kind of how steep is the turn on. So that's to say how many millivolts does it take to get a decade change in current. And so what that corresponds to is kind of what is the change in the potential across the barrier. So that's going to be how many millivolts. And now for the decade change in current, it's going to be given by the dec how many decades does it take to get a change in tunneling probability. And so then that's this. So we want to evaluate is this d phi d log t. So the one key assumption I'm making here is that I can sort of assume that my potential across the tunneling barrier is linear, and then I can just use this peak electric field. And in general, that's valid if we're in a case like this, where we're tunneling all the, straight through the barrier, and we have this large overlap region. Now the question becomes, let's say we have a junction that's just barely on, and let's say we have a very gradual change in the potential. So now here you might say, well, look, I have this really thick barrier because I have all of this tunneling region here. And then surely the peak field isn't the correct approximation. Now, but what we'll see later is that we'll have we won't actually see this barrier because there will be states that exist below this bandage. And so what happens is we actually end up really seeing sort of the bulk of the barrier. And so then this is sort of the key approximation is that we're just taking the electric field to be roughly a constant. But if we do that, we can get a, a really good insight into how the tunneling barrier performs, and in, in how the barrier thickness modulation performs. So here is just the derivative of the potential with respect to the log of the tunneling probability. And like we saw before, the tunneling probability is a bunch of constants over the field. So now if we just plug this into here, take that derivative, we get this large expression. And then now we can just back solve this field in terms of the tunneling probability and plug that into here, and we get this expression. And so this is a powerful expression, because what it tells us is that the steepness due to tunneling, barrier thickness modulation, is 1 over the log of the tunneling probability times the field divided by its derivative. And so once we know this, we know how steep the barrier thickness modulation is going to be. And so we can evaluate this for several different types of junctions. So for instance, if we have a lateral or a point tunnel FET, we could say that the field, or the peak field, will be sort of the potential across the barrier divided by some screening, screening length. And so the field by its derivative is just given by this potential. And similarly, if we had, say, a fixed width instead of a screening width, let's say we had some, through geometry, we fixed the width of the tunneling barrier, we would have a similar type of field profiling at the same result. And then that gives us a back-of-the-envelope expression for the steepness due to tunneling barrier thickness modulation. Just the potential across the junction divided by the log of the tunneling probability. And then we can do the same thing for other field distributions. For instance, a doped PN junction has a quadratic field distribution. So evaluating this gives us 2 phi. And so we get something similar, but with an extra factor of 2, telling us it's twice as bad. So now, what does this mean? Is this a reasonable expression? This actually explains a lot of the best experimental TFET results and it's still not good enough. Because what's happening is, if you look at it, this barrier height divided by the log of the tunneling probability. What that means is that as your current gets higher, your tunneling probability is going to approach 1. And that means your steepness is going to get worse, and it's going to start to roll off. And so this is exactly what we see in these experimental results. It's very steep at low current densities, 
So like for instance, in this result, it's around a nanoamp, where we start to see something around 60 millivolts per decade. But then once you get up to the higher, more interesting current densities, the steepness rolls off, and it's no longer very good. So unfortunately, we're only steep at a nanoamp per micron when we wanted a milliamp per micron. And so, we're only off by six orders of magnitude. And so now you could ask, well, surely, if you, you look at this expression, we say, all right, fine. At high tunneling probabilities, we have a problem. But we can just make this barrier height very small, and we'll still win. But even that doesn't cut it. So let's consider a typical tunneling probability. It'll be around 1%. So that log of that tunneling will be minus 2. And so let's say just to break even, to be as good as a thermally activated switch, we would to have a, this to be 60 millivolts per decade. It means we're going to have to have this be 120. And so it means we need a barrier height of 120 mill electron volts. And then you say, ah, sure, I can get that with the heterojunction, no problem. And say so we just build some sort of a heterojunction like that. But here is the problem with very small barriers. There are actually states that exist below the band edge. And so what that means is that you're never actually going to see this barrier if you try to tunnel. You're just going to tunnel straight into those states. And so you'll never get the on-off ratio that you need. So for instance, if we wanted a five orders of magnitude of on-off ratio, that means that there has to be five orders of magnitude fewer states down here than what we have at the band edge. And so we, we can parameterize how quickly these states decay. So let's say it takes some, mil some number of millivolts to get a decade change and the band edge density of states. We'll call that S DOS. So that's just kind of how many millivolts per decade change in band edge density of states. And so what that means that now, if you want a certain on off ratio, say five decades, and that means that this S DOS is going to have to be at least 24 millivolts per decade. So what that means is that we need a very sharp band edge. And if we had this very sharp band edge, we might as well use that to switch. Why bother trying to control the thickness of the tunneling barrier? And so then this is sort of the catch-22 that we end up in. If we, if we want to have good barrier thickness modulation, we need a very small barrier height. And then this small barrier height requires a sharp band edge to keep a good on-off ratio. And then once you have the sharp band edge, that's the better switching mechanism. And so then that's really a challenge that we face in trying to use barrier thickness modulation. And so, and one more point I just want to go over is that earlier I had mentioned that if we have sort of like a really long and shallow barrier, that we could, that we can't actually use that. And that's the same reason for these band edge states. It's because you're going to tunnel into these band tail states. And so the only thickness modulation that matters is sort of this central area part of the barrier. And so then that's where, why that peak field actually ends up being a good approximation. So kind of going back here where I said that this can really be used as a peak field. And that's because this little tunneling tail here is typically wiped out by the bandage density of states. And if it's not, that's great, but then you might as well use the bandage density of states to switch. So now we've kind of seen the difficulty in controlling the thickness of the tunneling barrier. And so that means we can't really use this to get both a steep turn on and a high current density. And so you definitely can get small improvements at a little bit lower current. And I think, I believe some companies are taking that approach, and it'll get you a little bit of improvement, maybe a couple generations worth. But if you want that orders of magnitude improvement, you're never going to get that out of modulating the tunneling barrier thickness. And so the alternative is that to look at energy filtering or density of state switching. But even this is not easy to achieve. Because ideally, we would have very sharp band edges. So as soon as we pull this band edge down a little bit, we have states to tunnel to. But in reality, there's a huge number of states here. And so even though this switch nominally should be off, we'll have this band tail that we tunnel to. And we're only going to see this band tail density of states. And that's going to determine our steepness. So then naturally, the good question to ask is, well, can we measure how steep are these band edges? So for a first measurement, let's try to look at optical absorption. 
because typically you would say if you had a perfect bandage, bandage, you would assume your optical absorption should drop off at your band gap. So first is here's the absorption in silicon. And with the perfect bandage, we would expect it to drop off abruptly at the band gap. But instead, we see that this absorption continues and follows a roughly exponential pattern. And so and this is even in an intrinsic material. And the reason for that is that we have thermal vibrations of phonons. And so what's going on is there are phonons that cause random strains and random thermal vibrations in the material. And that causes these band edges to shift up and down. And so then that smears them out, and you end up seeing sort of this average variation. But it's still not too bad. If you look at how steep this is, it takes 23 millielectron volts to get a decade change in absorption, which means that you can get a decade change in the density of states, which is much better than the 60 millivolts per decade of the thermal limit. So I'd be pretty happy if we could see this. Unfortunately, in any sort of experimental tunneling result, we're nowhere near this limit. So what's going on? So one of the huge problems is that in any typical tunneling junction, we use a heavy doping to get a very narrow tunneling barrier. And that's because you want to have a narrow depletion region. But when you dope a semiconductor heavily, you start creating band tails. And you start creating an impurity band. And so you can kind of see that here in the optical absorption versus doping. As we increase the doping to 1E20, the steepness of the optical absorption becomes around 60 millivolts per decade and worse. And what's unfortunate is that if you try to do an electrical measurement, it's likely to be even much worse than this. Because what's happening is in these heavily doped samples, there's a lot of free carriers that sort of screen the potential fluctuations. But in a depletion region in a tunneling junction, you're going to have all the impurity atoms, but you won't have the free electrons to screen it. And so your actual steepness will be even worse. And here's kind of illustrating this impurity band. So let's say we take a semiconductor and we dope it fairly heavily. We start forming this impurity band. And as you increase the doping, your impurity band gets worse and worse. And so now, what does this mean? Typically, I mean, when you think about doping a semiconductor heavily, you say that the band gap starts to narrow. But what that really means is you've created so many states that your band gap has effectively shrunk because you've let, sort of extending your band into these extra states. But now you can expect these states to have a sharp turn on. And, in and indeed they don't. You end up seeing this very gradual bandage. And so we end up with this self-defeating optimization. We try to increase our tunneling current, we dope it heavily, and we end up destroying the bandage. And so now, so far we've only looked at these measurements optically. It would be nice if we could also measure how steep of a turn on we can get in a tunneling junction electrically. So now one option is to go ahead and build a full transistor and then just measure its tra transistor characteristics. But a much simpler method is to actually just build a tunneling diode and then try to interpret its steepness. And so there's actually a very simple way we can do that. So here, for instance, we have a heterojunction indium arsenide gallium antimonide tunneling diode. And here is the band diagram. And so here is the IV. And what you can see, it's a typical Asaki diode. You have a large amount of current in reverse bias. Then we have this little bit of an Asaki region where the current increases in forward and then decreases, and then you have your normal forward current going up. And now we could try to ask, how steep is it? How many millivolts does it take to get a decade change in current? The problem is that we come here near this zero crossing, and it looks like it's getting infinitely steep, because it, it takes no voltage to get a decade change in current. But that's just an artifact of the sign changing, current going from positive to negative. So the key is to not look at the current, but rather the conductance, the current divided by the voltage. And that's because what's really changing as we turn the tunneling off is the conductance or resistance of the tunneling junction. And so then that's what we want to measure. And that's the same idea is that in the channel of a transistor, the gate is modulating the channel conductance. But the actual magnitude of the current is set by the source strain bias. And so if you just look at the conductance, you can actually read off how steep that tunneling junction is. And so there's a little bit of subtlety to prove it mathematically. And you can see that in this paper. But the first thing to note is that this is actually one of the best diodes out there. 
and it's not very steep, only 100 millivolts per decade. So that's somewhat worrying, because we're not seeing a very sharp turn on. So let's look at some other devices. So for instance, here is a tunnel fat that was built. And again, so this wasn't that great. There was a lot of defects in the oxide. And so if you look at its, the steepness of its IDVG, it's not that steep. It takes 216 millivolts change on the gate to get a decade change in the drain current. But what's nice is that if you take a look at its two terminal measurements, say we look at the drain current versus the drain voltage, and then plot the conductance, we actually see a much steeper cur curve. And that's just because this helps eliminate some of the gate parasitics. And so you can get a little bit better of an intuition of what's going on in the actual tunneling junction, rather than worrying about all the gate effects. And so this is kind of like another advantage of building the diode over a gate, over a gated transistor. And so now, what well, the thing to notice is that this is still not very steep. It's 165 millivolts per decade. We wanted 60. And so the same thing. Here is a set of diodes that in silicon germanium epitaxy. And here you can see is none of them are very steep. And we're sort of increasing the doping level as we go up. And the steepness is getting worse. Similar thing in gallium arsenide. It's not very steep. And as the doping gets high, it starts to get worse. Same thing in indium arsenide. Not very steep at all. So, I mean, I've definitely been emphasizing that this heavy doping is a major contributor to the lack of steepness. But there's a lot of other things that can also destroy the band edge. And really what it comes down to is any sort of spatial inhomogeneity. Because then you're going to have different thresholds throughout the device and different parts turning on. So heavy doping is a huge consideration. But another equally troubling thing could be thickness fluctuations, especially if you make small devices that have a large quantum confinement. Any change in the thickness will change your energies. And you also have your pho phonon effects. And any time you have interfaces, you can have a lot of traps there. So heterojunctions can create a lot of defects that can create a lot of traps. And another thing that can be very dangerous is in transistors, we have a gate oxide. And you typically have a high density of interface traps, maybe 10 to the 11 or 10 to the 12 per centimeter squared. And then now you consider your band edge density of states, say in a quantum well, is only going to be 10 to the 13 to 10 to the 14, depending on the material. So we, we, you can have a huge number of traps at your interface. And then if those don't fall off going into the band gap, that could destroy the band edge and prevent you from seeing a sharp turn on. And the last thing I want to just mention is, especially when building transistors, a lot of times you can have poor electrostatic design where you'll have parasitic paths that prevent you from seeing a sharp turn on. So now I want to kind of introduce what are some solutions to all of these problems. So one is that we need to get doping out of the tunneling junction. So one way you can do that is you could have electrostatically induced charges instead of dopant induced charges. So the idea here is that let's say we have a double gate structure where we have a P gate and an N gate. So the P gate will induce holes and the N gate will induce electrons, but all without doping. Therefore, we eliminate all that inhomogeneity due to the doping. And so having these two gates allows us to eliminate that problem. Another interesting option is called the bilayer tunnel FET. And the idea here is that when you, you put your N gate and P gate on opposite sides, and so what happens is your N gate, you start inducing electrons under this channel. And that's because this gate is going to invert the channel under it. But now your P gate is going to do the same thing. It's also going to attract holes under it. So what's really nice here is that you have this large tunneling area that's the entire overlap of the two gates. And it's undoped, so hopefully you will have better material quality. And so then this is, another, and then as we'll see later, there's actually additional benefits to this type of bilayer TFET when you have quantum confinement in the tunneling direction. But eliminating doping may not be enough. I mean, we really need atomic perfection in these materials. So it, it may mean that we may even have to look further out. For instance, monolayer semiconductors, such as these layered chalcogenides, provide a new opportunity because ideally there will be no dangling bonds. 
So if there's no dangling bonds at the edge of the semiconductor, that means you won't have those traps. And that could allow you to have a very good material quality and eliminate all of those defect states that would allow you to tunnel into the band tail. And so there's a lot of possibility maybe engineering these monolayer materials. Another uh, possibility is to try to just make very, very small devices. And the idea here is that let's say we make a very small nanowire, then we make it smaller than sort of our average trap density. And so we, hopefully we won't have any traps right in our tunneling junction. Of course, we're still going to have huge device-to-device -device variation, but at least this gives us a path to seeing a single good device and then tells us what we need to work on in order to improve more of them.